Pastor Harley asked me to speak tonight, and it worked out perfectly because I had a sermon that I had to prepare for class. And the sermon that I had to prepare for class were actually required. Part of the class requirement is to preach it in church. So it worked out, it turned out to be a blessing because now I get to, I had a, I had a dress rehearsal earlier today. Uh, that doesn't mean that it will be perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but um, I, at least I come prepared for you. And uh, please bear with me, okay, this message uh, is not going to be as, um, I, I don't think it will be as, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, where we communicate back and forth as, as, as usual. Um, yeah, there you go. Um, so please bear with me on that. Um, but. Um, so, excuse me. This is Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. My question to you today is, how are we doing with that? How are we doing on the individual level with fulfilling the Gospel Commission? And as you look at the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Around, around you, this church, uh, the global church as a whole, how are we doing uh, it, with this gospel commission? I believe this is an important question that we must ask ourselves on a regular basis, because as Jesus says, one does not light a lamp and put it under a bowl. If we are professing to be followers of Christ, if we are professing to be followers of Christ, we have been given we have been given a gift that must be shared with the world. I believe part of the reason we struggle with this in North America is because we lack an effective and consistent strategy to reach out to the world around us. With that being said, uh, today we will be looking at Judges 7. And I would like for you to keep these thoughts in the back of your mind as we read from the scripture. But before we dive into Judges 7, we need to discuss uh, historical context. Following the Exodus, God tasked the Israelites with ridding the promised land of the idolatrous inhabitants. Among these nations was the land of Midian. Now, the Midianites were descended, descendants of Midian, who was a son of Abraham after he took his second wife. Her name was Keturah, and we see that in Genesis 25.1. As the Israelites began conquering the promised land, they eventually became satisfied with what the lot that they had been given. They were satisfied with not completely fulfilling the requirements of, uh, that the Lord had, had set upon them. This unwillingness to fulfill the requirements given by the Lord had disastrous consequences for the people of Israel. This led to a, a slow, steady, but subtle and subtle compromise in their own religious system. The Israelites became idolaters, and in His infinite wisdom, God allowed the Israelites to become oppressed, um, to become oppressed by the same people they were supposed to conquer out of their, supposed to rid from their land. And throughout the book of Judges, we see this, this theme play out. We see the Israelites, you know, the Israelites were, uh, they, they gave in to idolatry, and then God would raise up a judge to deliver them. And so in the chapters uh, prior to Judges 7, God raises up Gideon to be uh, his judge and give the Israelites victory over the Midianites. So now we're going to read Judges 7, and we'll start with verse 1. And it says, then Jerubbabel, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him, rose early and encamped beside the well of Herod. 
so that the camp of the Midianites was on the north side of them, by the hill of Morah in the valley. And the Lord said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, My own hand has saved me. Now therefore proclaim in, in the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. And twenty-two thousand of the people turned, returned, and ten thousand remained. Now I don't know who among you has ever tried out for sports, but I envision this portion of the passage to be somewhat similar to a sports tryout. In this particular instance, twenty-two thousand people did not make the cut. They were told to hit the showers early, and in, and the reason for that is their hearts were not prepared to accomplish the task at hand. Also, God knew that had he allowed the Israelites to experience victory by great numbers, that they would have looked to themselves as opposed to giving glory to God where it belongs. God knew he needed a smaller group to show this true source of, of their power, even after this first cut of 22,000. God tells Gideon that it's time to make more cuts. Now we'll go back to Judges 7 and pick up in verse 4 and it says, But the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Bring them down to the water and I will test them for you there. Then it will be that of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, the same shall go with you. And of, of whomsoever I say to you, this one shall not go with you, the same shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, Everyone who laps from the water with his tongue, and as a dog laps, he shall set apart by himself. Likewise, everyone who gets down on his knees to drink. And the number of those people who lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, was three hundred men. But all the rest of the people got down on their knees to drink water. Then the Lord said to Gideon, By the three hundred men who lapped, I, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand. Let all the other people go, every man to his place. I really had a hard time figuring this out. Uh, wrestling, I wrestled with this passage a bit because I struggled to find a connection between the people who were uh, told to go home because they were afraid and the people who got down on their knees to drink water, because the Bible does not exact, it's, it's not exactly clear in that, uh, the re, in the reason for, uh, or a connection between the two, but thank God for the spirit of prophecy, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, I'm going to read from, from you a quote from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 549. It says, by the simplest means, character is often tested. Those who in time of peril were intent upon supplying their own wants were not the men to be trusted in an emergency. The Lord had no place in his work for the indolent and self-indulgent. The men of his choice were few, were the few who would not permit their own wants to delay them in the, in the, char in the discharge of duty. The 300 chosen men not only possessed courage and self-control, but they were men of faith. They had not defiled themselves with idolatry. God could direct them, and through them he could work deliverance for Israel. Success does not depend upon numbers. God can deliver by, by few as well as by many. He is honored not so much by the great numbers as by the character of those who serve him. So the connection there, right? The connection between those two groups, it, it, it was based on an issue of the heart. You had the first group who, who did not have faith in the promises of God, and the second group, who, were, who was more concerned about doing, about satisfying their own needs or wants. They, they, the, Ellen White talks about how the ones who, um, who, who, cut, who continued walking to, to cup the water and cup the water in their hands and lap it as a dog, that they were ready for the task at hand to, to go to war, to go to battle against the Midianites. And from that, I'll get, I get, we get our first point. If the issue was an issue of the heart between the two groups who got kicked out of the army, then that stands to say that the, the heart of the faithful, the 300 who, get, who the Lord chose with, to serve with Gideon, 
that their hearts were prepared for service. So the point, first point that I have is the faithful will prepare their hearts for service. This is an important key for us today because if we do not, because if we express any type of faith in God, our hearts must be prepared to carry out the work in which we are called to do. If we neglect the preparation process when our when our number is called and we are told to get in the game, we will end up missing opportunities to witness to those who desperately need to hear the gospel message. And how will we answer for that when the day of judgment comes? And also for those of you who, like me, were not born into the Adventist faith, someone, think about the first person who, who studied with you and who brought you into the Adventist church who who witnessed to you, what if that person had not been ready and their hearts had not been prepared to grasp the opportunity to witness to you? I think, I believe personally that I, I probably would not be an Adventist today. God may have a plan for me down the road, but I know I would not be here right now. Um, so we, our hearts must be prepared uh, for, for service. And, but the question then remains, how do, we, how do we prepare our hearts for service? If you would, turn, keep your hand in Judges 7, but turn with me real fast to Revelation 3. And we're just going to read in verse 18. It says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may, may, may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. Now this is not a Revelation seminar, so without going into too much detail, okay, and if you have questions about this, you know, we can talk about it afterwards, but the gold refers to faith, the white garments refers to purity or righteousness, and the anointing eyes with the eye salve refers to spiritual discernment. Thus we have Jesus' remedy for the church. Jesus tells us exactly what we need to do to prepare our hearts uh, and to, to be ready for, for service and for his second coming. Now if you would turn back with me to Judges 7. After God cut the army all the way down to 300, God decided to give Gideon a little bit of assurance and ease his heart a little. Gideon is told to go down to the camp of the Midianites and listen to what the Midianites are talking about. And we'll read in verse 13 and it says, and when Gideon had come there, uh, come, there was a man telling a dream to his companion. He said, I have, I have had a dream. To my surprise, a loaf of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian. It came to a tent and struck it so that it fell and overturned, and the tent collapsed. Then this companion answered and said, This is nothing else but the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. Into his hand God has delivered, the camp, has delivered Midian and the whole camp. And so it was when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation that he worshipped. He returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has delivered the camp of Midian into your hand. So how incredible is this? Gideon just so happens to overhear the discussion of the two Midianites talking. And, and, and in their discussion, it's revealed that they believe they're doomed to lose the war. The first Adventist I ever met worked at a gym, and, and this gentleman's name was Dale. And uh, I would go, I was not, uh, you know, I was going to church and stuff on Sundays, but Dale uh, was a personal trainer at the gym, and, and I would just go there and talk to him. I, I, he wasn't my trainer or anything, but you know, I would just go there, and we would, we would talk, and, and we been, began to uh, have share a bit of a bond and, and things like that. And part of the reason why is because at the time I was in the military, and Dale was, uh, he's prior army. He, but Dale had a very interesting job in the army. Dale's job was called Army PsyOps. And for those of you who don't know what Army PsyOps is, they basically, it's basically psychological warfare. Um, these people are taught to, uh, they, they're taught 
they go they're, they go down they go with like a first strike group and and they they can be the ones interrogating the, the prisoners that are taken in battle or they can be the uh, giving propaganda messages over the, over the loudspeaker to these people and, and to the to the enemy and, but the motto of the psyops is capture their minds and their hearts and souls will follow that means that the US military spends millions and millions of dollars tr on training and research to teach people how to do something that God did by sending a dream. And this brings us to our second point. God will prepare the field for our service. It is not our responsibility to convict or to convince anyone of the gospel truth. We don't need to argue with anyone about anything. Sometimes we may be that person that carries someone across the finish line to baptism or profession of faith. But that's not always the case. In most of our everyday encounters, our job is simply to show the love of Jesus to people. And it is through this type of encounter that the Holy Spirit will work to move people forward in the, in the faith. Amen. Turn with me, if you would, to uh, Luke 10, 2. Also, still keep your hand in, in uh, Judges 7, please. That's Luke 10, verse 2. It says, Then he said to them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the, of the harvest to send out laborers, to send out laborers into his harvest. Just as God did the work in preparing the minds of the Midianites to fear God, God is presently now, right now, working to the, prepare the hearts of and minds of lost souls in Cleveland, Texas. God could easily see, send his angels to complete the work, but he doesn't. He, God chooses not to do that. He chooses human agencies to propel the gospel to those lost souls. I'm going to read you another quote from the Spirit of Prophecy. It's uh, Christ's Object Lessons, page 237. It says, we are living in a time when the last message of mercy, the last invitation, is sounding to the children of men. The command, go out into the highways and hedges, is reaching its final fulfillment. To every soul, Christ's invitation will be given. The messengers are saying, come, for all things are now ready. Heavenly angels are still working in cooperation with human agencies. The Holy Spirit is presenting every inducement to constrain you to come. Christ is, a, is watching. For, for some sign that will betoken the removing of the bolts and the opening of the door of, of your heart for his entrance. Angels are waiting to bear the tidings to heaven that another lost sinner has been found. The hosts of heaven are waiting, ready to strike their harps and to sing a song of rejoicing that another soul has accepted the invitation to the gospel feast. The fact is that we are running out of time to spread the gospel. Every single day, we are one day closer to the second coming of Jesus. Every day, every day we s fail to spread the gospel through our words and actions, we are missing out on witness, witnessing God work miracles in people's lives. Which brings us to our third and final point, point three. Uh, when God's faithful accept the calling of God, amazing things happen. If you, if you would turn back with me to Judges 7. In verse 19. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outpost of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just as they had posted the watch, and they blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers that were in their hands. Then the, then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers. They, they held the torches in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands for blowing. And they cried, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And every man stood in his place all around the camp, and the whole army ran and cried out and fled. When the, when the three hundred blew the trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his companions throughout the whole camp. And the army fled to Beth Acacia, toward Zerora, as far as the border of Abel, Mehola by Tabith. 
Following this incredibly miraculous event, faith in God was restored to the Israelites. Finally, they had the courage to stand up to their oppressors, but look at what they missed out. What they missed out on. Because their hearts were unprepared for battle, they missed the opportunity to take place in and witness uh, God work in this miraculous way. How many of those who were sent home following the two tests thought after hearing the manner in which the Israelites won the battle, I wish I had been there to be a part of that battle. As someone who has been around people who have done extraordinary things in war, I've heard stories, and, and I've been there myself, wouldn't say anything extraordinary happened, but I can tell you that I, from my own experience, that I guarantee there were people from among those sent home that, that said to themselves, I wish I had been able to stay to witness God's work. Our work today is not to drive out any idolatrous, drive any idolatrous nation out of our land, but rather to drive the good news of Jesus Christ to a lost world around us, being right here in Cleveland, Texas. Amen. With that in mind, I ask you now, what is our strategy to accomplish this task? Now, I would like to preface this by saying I would never be one to presume to tell this church family what they need to do or what, uh, how they need to improve or anything like that. This is merely a thought that I would like for you to take home and chew on. Okay? The other, the other day, uh, someone came to me and asked me if I knew anything about a small group for men my age. And when they asked me that, I was dumbfounded. Uh, I was dumbstruck because... I, I racked my brain and I've been, you know, asking around and, and I don't know of anyone or of any small groups in the area that help create a sense of community that, you know, help create the fellowship atmosphere for fellow believers. You know, we have we have our prayer meetings, we have church on Sabbath, we have, um, you know, Vespers on Sabbath evening, you know, but how many people fall between the cracks because they don't have an opportunity to really get plugged in to the church? And the strategy, uh, the, the the small groups strat, uh, the small groups help create a sense, you know, that sense of accountability. You have someone there, you know, uh, you have fellowship, you know, and even we have the 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 uh, Sabbath schools. That's really still not the same. You know, uniting people based on common interests, it not only helps build up believers, but it also helps reach out to community based on common interests. So if I like bowling, I can invite somebody from work to come, you know, to my bowling small group where, you know, we, we pray and have devotion before we bowl, but then after that we're just common interest, you know. And that is something that um, we can use to, to witness to those people because in... In, breaking, in doing that, you would be breaking down barriers and opening doors that otherwise may not be open. People are not going to be open to me just saying, hey, come look at what I have for you in Revelation. You know, come look at the, the mark of the beast. And, and But sometimes it takes building relationships with people in order to grow uh, and, and, and to help them grow spiritually. So this strategy, I believe, is one we find in Judges here with Gideon and his 300. It's repeated throughout Scripture. Uh, you can see it, you know, in the in the disciples and the sending out of the disciples. And but this strategy has yet to be engaged with full force, with the full force of the global Seventh Day Adventist Church. So why not start with the Cleveland Church? Just something for you to chew on. In this prayer meeting, I see leaders of the church, and whether you are an elder, a deacon, a deaconess, or just a faithful parishioner. If you are here tonight, you are a spiritual leader in this church. You are the ones who could begin to set a new precedence in the church. A church that doesn't let people slip through the cracks. And I'm not saying that the Cleveland Church does that, because I believe we do a great job of welcoming and showing love to, to anyone that comes through those doors on the Sabbath morning. But maybe it could help. And... 
as we close here, I'm getting to the end of my message. And, and as we close here, I would like to share with you one of the most meaningful moments I ever shared with my father. I grew up seeking attention and approval from my father, as most boys do. I can remember playing sports, and you know, if I lost uh, and or did something wrong on on the court, especially on the judo mat, if I lost, all I had to do was look at my dad before I even stepped off the mat, and I could see disappointment dripping off of his face. At least that's how I perceived it, and so I grew up with this desire and and this the seeking attention and approval from my father, but. One day, I decided to join the military, and everyone in my family said it was a mistake. But uh, they said I would never make it. I was not cut out for the military. And they were right. I was not cut out for the military, but I, I survived. So, Praise the Lord. Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, so I went anyways, and, and for those of you who have never been in the military, Basic training is one of the most miserable times of your life. It is absolutely terrible. You don't get sleep, okay? You don't get to sleep, and if you do sleep, you don't sleep for very long. The food is terrible. You get a total of five minutes to eat it per meal. Living with 60 other guys is not keen, okay? It's not the greatest thing to do. And of those 60 guys, that's... 60 guys, that means 10 to a shower. So that's not really my style, right? And the worst of all of this was the yelling. The yelling every single waking minute of the day. Somebody screaming at you about something that you're doing wrong. The look on your face is wrong, so they want to yell at you about it. And curse and all that stuff. Just a horrible experience. And weeks, so that built up, you know, weeks of that built up to... Weeks of anticipation for the day of graduation, the day when I finally get out of here. I'm so ready to do this. So part of that, 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 that looking forward to graduation was emphasized by the isolation from my family. I didn't get to talk to my family for weeks. Finally, the day came. Graduation day was here. After a horrible time away from my family and everyone that I ever knew, I marched as a unit in front of a crowd, and, and everyone got to soak in what you know, we had been doing for the past few weeks. And you know, finally, after that ceremony was over, I was able to spend a little bit of time with my family. When I was saying goodbye to all of them, I remember my dad sort of standing off to the side, you know, um, and he was the last one that I said goodbye to. And he had this look on his face. And I won't forget that look because he doesn't get it too often. But it's that look that he gets when he's fighting back tears. And he hugged me at that point. And he said as he hugged me in my ear, he said, Go forth and conquer, my son. All the years of attention and approval seeking culminated in that moment. Go forth and conquer. We have all been given the tools. We know the task. We know that we are, at this time, preparing our hearts for service to God. For Him to just open that door, and we walk through it. You know, at any time in our, in our daily life, we never know when that, when that moment will come. And it's time for us to submit to the will of God, by allowing Him to use us to tell the world that Jesus Christ saved us, and He will save them too. I would like to appeal to those of you here today to begin to pray for God to open doors for you to witness to the world around you. I would like for, I would also like to pray that God would show you an effective, God would begin to show you effective strategies for witnessing. You know, the strategy that I discussed about small groups, that's just one idea, you know. That may not be the right one for, for us and for this church here. I mean, my future is uncertain in May, so even if I was one trying to you know, push this small group's initiative, you know, it, it, it may fall apart after I leave, if I leave in May. So, you know, uh, it just, it, I pray that God will, I pray.
pray that God will, you know, begin to show you the proper strategy uh, that would be most effective, most effective, effective to witness to the community. And finally, um, it is my prayer that all of you go forth and conquer. So, if that is your prayer with me uh, today, would you please bow your heads with me now? Our Father in heaven, Lord. I thank you again for the opportunity to pause in the middle of the week and draw closer to you, Lord. I thank you for allowing us to be in a place where we can open your word freely and study and discuss things relating to you, where we can pray without persecution, Lord. Father, right now, I just lift up every heart and mind that is in this room to you, Lord. I ask that you would open doors and show these these people, Lord, your servants opportunities where they will have to witness uh, and bring people into your kingdom, Lord. I pray that you would show them effective strategies, uh, an effective strategy that would work uh, for this church and, and continue, that it would allow this church to grow and, and just be a church that witnesses uh, to the Cleburne community, Lord. I thank you for everyone in this room, Lord, and it is my prayer that you bless these people as they go from this place, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.